So when someone goes to you over another lawyer, you're like, yo, let's calculate what your costs are going to be based off your property. Are you a first time home buyer? Here are the incentive programs. Like what's, I mean, I think people want to know, like when they go to you, like what's going to be that benefit, right? I mean, it seems like you're saving a lot of money that they might or might be paying unwillingly or unknowingly. Hold up. Really excited for today's guest, Eli Zabar from Zabar Corporation. Eli, welcome to our show. Hi, Paul. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I know you bet, man. I'm especially excited to have you on because I feel like lawyers in general, especially for real estate, they don't do enough education on why you are important in the mortgage and real estate home buying process, which we'll dive into today. And secondly, few of them are, are, are outspoken or put things candidly in easy to understand language. I feel you're especially good at that. Uh, so yeah, I'm very excited to have you just break things down. I'm getting a lot of uh, questions from people when they're in the middle of deals. <laughs> when these are questions they want to ask before they get into buying a home. So yeah, we're going to focus a lot on that today. But first, with a quick introduction, uh, tell us about the impetus behind Zabar Law Corporation. And yeah, what makes you guys different? What should people get excited about uh, when they start uh, talking to you? Sure. Yeah, happy to chat about that. We've got Zabar Law Corporation. I am Eli Zabar of Zabar Law Corporation. Mm -hmm. I am at this point a one lawyer firm and I have about five support staff that work for me. I'm standing here today in my home office. I started um, a year and a half ago, February 2020 or 2019, I should say, is um, when I started this firm. And I've run it from a home office, fully virtually, fully remote, paperless, as much as possible yeah. since day one. And, um, you know, when all of these, everybody started working from home and COVID happened, my business didn't really skip a beat. And, right. yeah. and that's because I try, unlike a lot of other law firms that are very paper-based, that are very physical location-based, sure. I service clients all over BC, all over, and outside outside Canada even. I've got clients in the US, I've got a, a client in Europe, I've had clients in the South Pacific, because people, uh, I believe that people should be able to access a lawyer at a reasonable price, wherever they are, if they need one in Vancouver. Yeah. So I have the system set up to talk, to connect with people and get their work done wherever they are, so long as the work that they need done um, needs to be done by a lawyer in Vancouver and you know like we've worked on something together where I got a mm. I got a transaction done a refinance done with a guy sitting at his beach house in Mexico right <laughs> and I and you know for me that's a win-win right yes. there's no there's that no there's no, there's no reason why he should have to come back to Vancouver to yeah no kidding house. man I'm so grateful you solved that for us that's a big reason why you're on today I'm like you pull off ninja tricks like that. I mean, damn, people got to know. Uh, but maybe let, let's just lead a bit into that, right? Like a lot of people uh, during COVID don't want to go and sign things, in, uh, I guess, in person or they're stuck somewhere, God forbid. So walk us through how you sort of solved a bit of this transaction. Of course, he who will remain anonymous. But, you know, why don't you talk about that? And that can lead us into just a bit about like the actual pro, the closing process when someone... Uh, has gotten the mortgage approved by me and it's about to all, you know, it's like the final seal of approval and uh, you want to make sure you're prepared. So yeah, maybe walk us through a bit of that story. Sure. So fundamentally the role like of a lawyer in this transaction is to make sure that the documents that show that you have purchased or refinanced a house actually get registered with the government. The government agency that's responsible for this is called the land title office. Mm -hmm. And there used to be a time when if you wanted to buy a house, you actually had to go or send someone like your lawyer to the office to wow. actually fill out paperwork. But now everything is done online. Um, and the land title office has a bit of a strange system where they give me a special digital signature that I can use to file documents like mortgages and like land title transfers online 
by having the client sign physical copies of the documents and then I upload, I basically say, you know, I'm a lawyer and you can trust me, land title office, that um, I actually have these documents signed. So it's kind of a bit of a strange system where I have to get documents signed, but then the government never actually asks for, to see, to asks to see, you know, what we would call the wet ink signatures. This posed a problem when COVID hit in that generally you needed, the lawyer needed the wet ink signatures and it needed to happen in person. There was no way to get um, a mortgage signed unless you had a face-to-face -face meeting with the person. And of course, you know, if somebody's out of town or in a quarantine situation, mm -hmm. you can't meet people um, in person. It's just not safe. So okay. thankfully, and and um, and fairly rapidly, the land title office, um, despite calls to have this done years and years ago and being told that, yeah. you know, it's just too complicated. Yeah. Uh, in a matter of days, we were allowed to, um, swear documents, swear affidavits, sign everything over Zoom, just with, um, there's a bit of a technical process. It's about a 12, they issued like a 12 step, 13 step process to get this done. Right. And you know, the, the transaction we did was, I think day two of these, of these new rules, they were so fresh where I was on the phone with the land title office, getting them worked out while the people at the office were, saying, let me figure that out and get back to you. So sure, yeah. these were very, very new rules, but, um, and they were the first time, like, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm thinking that I was one of the first people to actually use the rules simply because we were closing within days of COVID happening yeah, um, totally. and the rule changes. So, and it, and it worked, it, we, we were able to do a refinance transaction that otherwise would have cost the client, I mean, how much does it cost to come back from Mexico just to sign a document, right? Like that. Right, yeah, I mean, that would be insane. Yeah, like that would pretty, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know I, <laughs> how yeah, much this guy was saving, but like that, you know, two, three grand on a round trip flight doesn't sound like a good, uh, doesn't sound like an economical way of signing a document. So, and you know, he still had to put the documents in the mail from Mexico and send them to me. Sure. So there's still sort of vestiges of the old school way, but um, yeah, we got it done. And I'll tell you that with all of these restrictions, I mean, sometimes clients don't have access, don't have webcams, they don't have printers, right? So there is issues on the other end where sometimes clients just aren't comfortable with um, technology. So, you know, in that sense, like I've gone out, um, I go all over the lower mainland. Cool. People. Yeah. We've had, you know, in the last couple of months, couldn't meet people in person. I've done, I've signed million dollar deals on park benches. Right? That's like hilarious. I've done, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, they, um, you just have to adapt there. You have to be like, I think the number one word for business in COVID during COVID is pivot, right? If you can't, if you can't pivot, if you can't adapt and use the tools that you're given from technology and the new freedom, yeah. you're dead in the water. So Yeah, I agree. That's awesome. So let's jump into like an actual like real life process. So John had to go through a bunch of steps. So he had closing costs, which people seem to forget about, right? Lenders actually say you have to have 1.5% of your actual purchase value in closing costs. Put set aside in your bank account just so we, so we know it's there and that it roughly covers closing costs. Why don't you go over to like the high level of closing costs? There's a lot. Maybe even more importantly, the closing costs people forget about. Sure, yeah. So closing costs generally, the reason people say like one to 1 1.5% is because you've got to think that the big, big ticket items are the, <clears throat> um, sorry, the big ticket items are the property transfer tax. CPT, yep. Right. If there's GST, and then of course the which is you know like on new new homes and, and GST like is only for new properties, correct? New new yep, uh, construction. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, and then for um, real estate for real estate agent commissions, which is traditionally 
those costs are traditionally borne by the seller. They usually pay both sides, but that is mm -hmm. something where, you know, I don't know if it, it's obviously going to be buyers and sellers um, watching this video. So that's something the real estate commissions from both sides are traditionally paid by the, um, by the seller. But so those are the big ticket items like your real estate. A lot of people think lawyers are expensive, but my fees come to 90% less than the average real estate commission on a deal in Vancouver, because uh -huh. I don't charge um, based on the value of the property. For me, a property that's 500,000 or 5 million, right. if it's just a single, you know, if it's a single property with a single owner and a single mortgage, you're mm -hmm. going to be paying the exact same amount. Whereas with a real estate agent and sometimes mm -hmm. with mortgage brokers or with insurance or things like that, they're really pegged to the um, value of the property. So what I think a lot of people forget, and I don't even know if it's forget, I think that a lot of, there's a lot of sort of mystery around the legal fees and the, the government registration fees so that, that are required to do, uh, to buy a house or to do a refinance. And those are all some things that are borne by the buyer or by the refinancer. And they, they do add up. So, you know, you'll see a lot of notaries, you'll see a lot of lawyers where they'll say, they'll advertise a service like, well, I do, you can do your purchase with a mortgage for 400 bucks, right? And then they'll send you a bill for $1,400 and say, well, here's my $400 bill, right? And, and people get really upset with that, and, and rightly so, because they don't understand that the, the $400 is just the fee for the person's time, right? So I have my fee for my time, and then there's also, and then over and above that, there are all sorts of fees that I don't have any control over, but that I am responsible to pay. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's understandable from the consumer's perspective, money is money, and if it's going to the lawyer, they, they view it as legal fees. And that's one of the reasons why I try to educate mortgage brokers. And of course, when I speak to the clients, um, now more so than ever, I try to give them an estimate of the, the best estimate I can of their closing costs. And unfortunately, it is a bit of an estimate until you get right up to the point of closing, because I'll give you an example. If you're buying a house that's in a strata, and every strata company has slightly different fees for what they'll charge to give you all the documents that you would want and you would need in order to buy a strata unit. You know, if you buy a strata unit, you want to make sure that there's not a $10,000 special assessment coming down the pipe in two months. And if there is, that's fine, but you want to make sure that you're, you know about that and that you're not sure. caught off guard, right? I had a transaction where a guy, the day before closing, the strata had an AGM and retroactively hiked strata fees $400 a month, three months retroactive, right? So that guy, and, and there was no way of us, you know, there was no way of us predicting what the AGM totally. was gonna do, but these are things where, you know, stratas, that, that raises and, and that raised the cost the closing cost for him. He had to pay those fees. So yeah. the more you, you want to get out in for strata purchases or strata refinances, a lot of people don't realize that their strata management company, even if they've been living there forever, is going to charge sometimes 50, sometimes 100 or $150 just to get the documents over to you. And then if you need a, and then let's say you want to close quickly and you know, you've got a good, your rate's expiring or a deal's trying to get done. Um, I've seen places that charge over $200 to get you something you know, next business day. So that's one thing that I find a lot of people don't realize uh, and don't know about. And then the other big thing is that I was talking earlier about the land title office. The land title office has a fee for absolutely everything that you could do. At any time you interact with them, beyond calling them with a question, there's a fee. Yeah. So when you buy a house, at very, very minimum, you're going to be paying a fee to, assuming you have a mortgage, most people have a mortgage, mm -hmm. you're going to be paying a fee to register 
system to tell the land title office that you officially own the home. Right. And then you're going to have to pay another fee to tell the land title office that you paid off the purchaser's or the seller's mortgage, right? Like if I buy a home from you, I pay off your mortgage and then I put my new mortgage on the property. So mm -hmm. that's two different mortgage registration or discharge and registration fees. And then another land title registration fee um, to make, to tell the land title office that you are in fact, you know, that Paul no longer owns the property and Eli does own the property. Right. And then <laughs> even though you're the one that submits the paperwork, you have to pay them another like 10 bucks to do a search of their system to confirm that they actually wrote the details down that you gave them correctly. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I've actually had experience having to do a land title search because someone, because actually the client who was refinancing had a lien on the property and I didn't know about that. So we were already pretty far into the process. So yeah, it's death by a thousand paper cuts, right? So I think there's a lot there. There's also land title insurance as well. So like there's oh, yeah, a lot. There's title, yeah, there's title insurance. And then there's also, I mean, it depends. Some mortgages require, you know, that you have fire insurance or it depends if you get into rural Canada or rural BC, there's all sorts of issues with that. And yeah, like even, you know, we've had, we've worked on transactions where somebody has a random, like a crown lien. Right. Um, wow. Right. And it's just, you know, and that might, it might be 50 bucks or 200 bucks that you're sure. still going to be paying, um, you know, $20, $50. And well, it, it's it a lot. Adds up. Yeah. Death by a thousand paper cuts. So if they go to you, Eli, you're going to de demystify this. I'm already getting busy hearing about all these different costs. Like, so when someone goes to you over another lawyer, you're like, yo, let's calculate what your costs are going to be based off your property. Are you a first time home buyer here? The incentive programs, like what's, I mean, I, I think people want to know, like when they go to you, like what's going to be that benefit, right? I mean, it seems like you're saving a lot of money that they might or might, might be paying unwillingly or unknowingly. Well, so, you know, unfortunately, try as I might, I can't get the government to charge me less. So right. those kinds of, low, those kinds of um, fees are, are out of my control. But Basically. what I can do is whenever I get a new client, I always ask them, you know, do you have a strata? Do yeah. You, yeah. Are you getting a mortgage? Uh, and do you have a title search from the, uh, of the property, right? Because with that information and also where like the address of the property yeah. because that gives me enough information to give them a quote for costs at least within you know a hundred or a hundred and fifty dollars assuming that everything they tell me is is correct right and that the title search that they give me is current and accurate and doesn't have mm -hmm. you know there hasn't been something registered since then so I think that a lot of lawyers will just tell you their fee and then they don't really want to put in the time or the effort hmm. to draw up a proper quote. Um, so I, I have no problem doing that. And of right. course, if those things change, the first thing I do, like if I realize, hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not infallible, I have made mistakes before. And right. the first thing I do when I make a mistake, get on the phone, call the client, explain what what happened explain how we're going to fix it if there's any costs associated mm -hmm. you know that's um like sometimes people want to close faster say hey i want to close at the end of the month and they go actually i realize that my penalties or something will be way higher if i don't close next week and i say okay well that's going to be a rush fee from your strata and and i try to do everything in my power to anticipate those costs for my client as far as things like first time home buyers incentives, that's something where I always try to work with their mortgage broker or their right. real estate agent to really make sure that they're being educated. And that's why I love working with like mortgage brokers over and over because then we can spot, we can grow and learn together where we can spot um, common areas for education for clients and then determine whose job it is to do that education. Right. I think it's totally reasonable to require a lawyer to educate their client about all the different land title fees because I'm the one who does that paperwork. Sure. 
Um, but you know, I think that um, a law that a mortgage broker or a real estate agent should know if their um, if their client is a first time home buyer. Sure. And yeah. should yeah, and should be able. And I think that that's something that a lot of mortgage brokers that I speak with and that I work with don't know is that they are not actually sure where their job ends and where mine begins. Because to their clients, especially in a refinance situation, they come, the mortgage broker comes to me for the quote and then delivers it to the client. And so I have to have a good relationship to get enough info from that mortgage broker so that they can look good to their client by giving them an accurate quote. So it's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship where I have to educate the, the clients and the mortgage brokers, but they have to educate me back in knowing, knowing the right details, giving me the right details, and um, making sure that if there are, you know, no, I've done a lot of conveyances and I've never come across one that I could actually describe as simple, right? Even the most simple conveyance, they always have some, something, something you've got to work out. You mean like, Funding, or you mean an actual file, right? Just to translate for the people who don't know what. what that oh is. yes, so a conveyance is basically any time when you transfer ownership of a property from one person to right. another, or you register, like, pay off one mortgage and uh, register a new one. And that's so someone, like, when a lawyer says, "I have a conveyancer," and I do have a conveyancer, that's somebody who is not a lawyer but who has trained to do specifically do the paperwork required to do what's called a conveyance. Got it. And I think, yeah, and I think there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of those terms, you know, possession, adjustment, closing, all of those things that, um, that there is a lot of, um, you know, the realtor, real estate agents know a little bit about possession and closing dates, mortgage brokers know about adjustment dates, lawyers have to know about all of the dates but there you know and there really isn't a central way to learn about this there isn't really like the real estate council the mortgage brokers association they don't and and the law society no one takes the full responsibility for saying this is the cost of buying a home and this is the process and it's it's it really it really kills me because this is the biggest transaction that 99% of people will right. ever do in their life. Of course. Right? Yeah. I mean, unless you're like me and you do real estate law um, or you have a very successful business, you're not writing million dollar checks very yeah, often. Of course. Yeah. Right. So the most people, if you don't own a business, if you're an employee your whole life, your home purchase will be the biggest financial purchase, the biggest transaction of your entire life. And you have to, people get really nervous and understandably so, because there's a lot of, their, this is their nest egg for real, especially in Vancouver, this yep, is their yeah, retirement fine. fund, mm -hmm. right? This is their kid's education fund. And if you, if you screw it up, like there are people who, there are, there are ways where you can have your mortgage registered in second priority to another mortgage and then, and not, uh, and just not be foreclosed on without even knowing that it's going to happen. There are ways that you can, there are, I mean, we learn this in law school in real estate class that when a lawyer or a notary doesn't do their job, sometimes you don't actually get the house that you, that you paid for. And then can, can we clarify that? Sorry, like notary versus real estate lawyer, like what's the difference? So really what's the difference is that a notary has the right to do has the license to do the paperwork, but does not have the license to give you any legal advice about whether you should do the paperwork in a different way or if there's a better way to do it. So for instance, if somebody, a, a notary can register documents to the land title office, they can take money into trust in order to pay things off. But if you ask a notary to look at your, if you get your strata documents and you ask the notary, can you tell me if there's an adjustment that I'm going to have to pay um, that's you, going to cost me a lot of money? Adjustment? What do you mean by adjustment? Oh, yeah. So, so sorry. Uh, sorry. I just mean a special levy. Um, so if a strata, like let's say if the, you buy into a strata 
and the elevator is about to meet the placing. Yeah, yeah. Or like the building envelope needs to be resealed. You know, well, something. That, that, by the way, lenders do not like to see envelope issues on uh, on properties. So I had a deal that yeah. well, uh, was very hard to place because of that. So okay, so there's, yeah. there's things happening in the building. Which so is, so there's something there's wrong with the building, it. or let's say you know a lot of people like notaries are not allowed to give legal advice. So no, if a notary. No. And, and you know, and a lot of no, like some notaries um, give sort of pseudo legal advice, and it's a bit of a, I think, a bit of a gray area for them. Right. But you can know that if you ask um, a notary a question, it's their right. basically personal opinion. And if you ask a lawyer a question, you can take that answer to the bank. So okay. if you ask me, does this strata have, am I going to be paying $10,000 for my share of an elevator replacement in six months? And I say yes, or I say no, and I'm wrong. You can come to me any time in the future after I've told you that. And you can say, Eli, you were wrong about this and you have to fix it. And I have, I have very expensive insurance that is exactly there because oh, exactly. I am responsible. And that's something that Notaries are responsible as well for making sure the money gets paid, but they can't give you legal advice. And then more so than that is that I, I take the time, when I mention that my clients said it's the biggest transaction of your life, um, people don't realize that when you're doing the biggest thing of your life, you need to consider what happens at the end of your life. And nobody, especially first time home buyers, like to think about what happens when they die. Right. But I can tell you that the moment you, if you walk out of your lawyer's office um, or, you know, you end the Zoom call with your lawyer and you officially own a house the next day and you get hit by a bus and you don't have a will, that's a serious problem. Who pays your mortgage? How does the house get dealt with? You know, there, if you die without a will and you own property, that property is probably going to be in limbo for at least a year while the people around you figure out how to get rid of it. And you have to, if you die without a will, you somebody has to go to court and prove to a judge that you died without a will and then has to contact every single person that may be entitled to that house and let them essentially fight over it. So, Interesting, huh? So, so, so you do I, wills? Yeah. So like you do wills? So, so and when a notary I, won't. So a notary, um, a notary can, if you go to a notary with a pre-done will. Got it. Back to the advice can, thing. They can Back sign to the it. Thing, yeah. But if you tell a, uh, yeah, but if you tell a notary, you know, I have three children. One of them, you know, is like 16, is on a bit of a rough path. And I, if I die tomorrow, I don't want to give them their money until they're 30. Right, how do I do that? And that's something where a notary is not allowed to is not allowed to give you advice on that. So what I do is when I have somebody doing a, uh, a purchase with me or a refinance, as I say, you know, not only do you have a will, which I write there, I think arguably more importantly, when you buy uh, land is a power of attorney, because a power of attorney, let's, let's say you, you know, let's say, like, let's take a, a, a for a current example of COVID, one of the things if you get COVID is you can expect to be in the ICU in a medically induced right. coma for, for weeks or months. Right. So let's say, you know, you have to, you want to, you want to refinance your house in order to raise the funds to cover your recovery. Right. You know, you've missed work, all of that. Your family needs money. Sure. If you don't have a power of attorney, there is no way to have your home refinanced because you are the only if you're the only person on title because you are legally unable to sign documents right you're in a medical oh, home. yeah so you, you can do that stuff huh right so you so i write like and um i write these documents and they're, they're very simple documents but you need to have them and they're documents that allow you to walk to show them to the land title office and say look you know, if I was your power of attorney, Paul, I would be able to say, listen, Paul trusts me enough that I can buy and sell his land for him. And this is the document proving why. And then the land title office says, that's great. 
and you know looks it over and assuming it's all good that uh, and you know that just speaks to another reason you definitely want a lawyer because you won't be around to if things you know things go sideways you're incapacitated right, right. you're in the hospital or you're dead and that's um you know that you have to have a lot of trust in that document yeah, no, 100%. That's well, good you clarified that. And look, we've covered a lot today, man. I'm trying to distill it into like some key takeaways. So it seems that firstly, why you're different. I mean, people can see, of course, that you're extremely educative, but uh, which I think is really important, especially if people need that as first time home buyers, especially even if they're mortgage brokers who really want to make sure that they don't play the game of broken telephone. They want to, like, you seem to be very good at aligning with people, communicating. That's half the battle. Obviously, you mentioned why a real estate lawyer versus a notary gives a lot more advice, and it is worth paying maybe a small premium on. I'm guessing notaries are usually a little less expensive. Yeah, I mean, I always say, like, you know, you can save money doing your own dental work as well. Of course, right? yeah, yeah. But so, I don't suggest. Yeah, like, that's not a good idea. You're not that much more than a notary, right? So I think people no. can worry about that. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. And yeah. then, yeah, obviously you've talked a lot about, yeah, like ways that you can help people realize what hidden costs are coming. The things around strata, it's massive. Uh, I don't think people do enough of that. So it's clear you can save people money. Uh, you're going to be there, meeting them on a park bench, on Zoom, wherever. Your overhead, yeah. your overhead costs are extremely low. They always have been. So you can actually give great service and justify, you know, perhaps a cheaper price than most lawyers, not to mention yeah. you're a lot more transparent. And you can do that because you've built your business around that. They're not just getting some cheap service. They're getting. No, I don't, I don't compete on price. Yeah. I don't compete on price. I compete on margin, right? I charge market rates and I just run a business that's lean where I can provide, I can provide high quality legal services um, for, for a good price just because I'm able, I don't have to, you know, I don't have a fancy office with a view. Right. Yeah, yeah no, I love it. You're uh, grinding it out, man. That's good. You're, I mean, perfect for entrepreneurs. I think I work with a lot of self-employed people that are very practical about things and progressive. So and um, I'll I also say that I'm happy to make, take, like, I love talking to mortgage brokers. I love talking to real estate agents and I won't, you know, if, if somebody calls me and they have a weird file they want to talk about or, you know, sure. they're considering they, they got a potential client and they don't know quite what to do and they want to talk to a lawyer or, you know, they watch this video and they're just interested to know more about closing costs. Like I'm happy to talk to people. I've got like a booking link. I've got all of that stuff where, well, you know, well, you my, know, how can people find you just to wrap up here? Yeah. So, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn under Eli Zabar, Z-B-A-R. You can go to my website, zabarlaw.com. So Z-B-A-R-L-A-W.com. Um, you know, you can, I'm the only Eli Zabar out there. Uh, yeah, you can sure. Google me. And, nice. Um, Good SEO. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm happy to talk to people on an informal basis. And I promise that unless you agree that I can send you a bill at the end, that I won't send you Fair a bill enough. at the end. And, you know, oh, there's really? sometimes, uh, yeah, I'm happy to give quotes and I'm happy to just be a sounding board because I, For sure. I really think that there's not enough lawyers out there that are willing to talk to people sure. um, in a way that's collaborative, in a way that's informative. You know, I always say that I don't call myself a lawyer. I call myself an entrepreneur with a license to sell legal services. I like it. I like it. Yeah. So, yeah. Like if you're somebody, if you're entrepreneurial and you just want to talk to a lawyer about anything, I love you know, it. I'm happy to hear you out. I love Sounding it. Sounding board, man. It's important. Uh, Eli Zabar, this has been a pleasure. I wish we had more time. There'll definitely be a part two to this. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for your time and stay safe. And for everyone who's watching, keep leveling up your living.